All right, hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to a really fast recap of everything of Unit 2, Aerostay 2, Aggregate Supply Side Policies. We are going to do an under 10 minute summary of everything in this topic, covering some recent policies and how they tie into Aggregate Supply, what they try and do. So let's get straight into it. So, Aggregate Supply. All right, so we're getting into the nature, operation, aims of Aggregate Supply Side Policies and the relationship to the domestic macroeconomic goals, international competitiveness, and living standards. So, when we talk about the nature of Aggregate supply side policies, it's what they do. They are aiming to create favorable supply side conditions for businesses to increase their productivity and aggregate supply. The operation of aggregate supply side policies is how they do that. We'll get into that with each of the different types of policies, how they actually operate. And the aims of them is to create those favorable aggregate supply side conditions, either lower cost of production, increase productivity or efficiency, increase our production capacity, therefore increases our overall aggregate supply. The relationship to domestic macroeconomic goals, well, if cost of production goes down, that means we're going to achieve inflation or we're more likely to achieve inflation less inflationary pressure uh, if we are more productive that's going to lead to increased employment and we're going to achieve full employment and it's also going to lead to increased production which is going to lead to increased gdp and therefore more likely that we are going to achieve the goal of strong sustainable economic growth uh, how makes this more internationally competitive? Well, lower cost of production means that we can lower our prices, therefore compete more with our overseas competitors who have lower wages, etc. And living standards, well, if we are all these things, lower prices can be passed on to consumers, therefore maximizes our overall benefit. So agri supply side policies aim to either decrease the cost of production for businesses or improve their productivity or efficiency in some way. The relationship between efficient allocation of resources and agri supply, well, the efficient allocation of resources is that we're maximizing our output per unit of input in a way that maximizes society's living standards. So let's looking at mainly allocated efficiency. We can also look at technical or productive efficiency, dynamic efficiency, and intertemporal efficiency in this topic, but we're gonna mainly focus on this one for this. Um, for increasing uh, output per unit of input, this means the aggregate supply is also likely to be increasing, which is great. Um, we're gonna improve living standards because if we are producing more, there is more choice for society, therefore more goods and services available. Um, all these our policies, if they lower cost of production, that's going to improve productive efficiency as they're getting more output per unit of input, less cost maximum output. Dynamic efficiency, well, a lot of aggregate supply size policies actually um, move production into areas where it is needed, such as subsidies for solar panels, etc. Therefore, that makes us more dynamically efficient. And also by uh, making us more productive, we're getting more output per unit of input. Therefore, there are more resources left for future generations, making us more intertemporally efficient. So that's our efficiencies right there. Now getting into spending on education and training. So how um, education and training influences aggregate supply and the achievement of our goals. So education and training, it's all about aiming to improve the quality of human capital. So that's really important. It's about improving the quality of human capital. So essentially they're getting more GDP per hour work. So they're producing more output per unit of input. An example of this is the government's job trainer scheme, which aims to provide education and training in areas where Australia is facing skill shortages to create a more productive workforce and increase aggregate supply. So this is meaning giving skills to the unemployed people that they can, then can get employed, and therefore that increases our productive capacity because we're more able to produce more productive resources and therefore increase the aggregate supply of role. Obviously this has the same flow on effects to all of our three domestic macroeconomic goals. More people are employed, more likely to achieve full employment, more production, more economic growth. Uh, if there are more people able to be employed, it's gonna bring down cost of production for businesses and therefore um, make it more likely we're gonna achieve the goal of low inflation. Research and development grants, very, very important research and development grants can fall into an analyzed question because there are two main effects that you need to talk about with them. And there are some things that language that is really important to you. So research and development grants are offered to businesses usually with generous tax benefits to conduct research and development that they might not normally attempt due to the associated cost and lack of guaranteed benefit. That's really, really important for research and development. The main reason that without government interference, businesses don't conduct research and development is because it may not actually lead to any actual benefit for the businesses. So they, they may conduct research and development and at the end of the day, their research goes to nowhere and they don't actually have any productive benefit from it. So by doing things like the policy that gives a 45% tax offset for businesses who conduct research and development, it means that businesses face less risk and are more motivated to conduct research and development, which may lead to advances in productivity, increased accurate supply, the same flow and effects to all of our domestic macroeconomic goals. So may lead to is really, really important. So if you get an analyzed question about research and development, it's aiming to increase our productivity and increased accurate supply through those productive increases that come from that research and development, whether it be through technology or new techniques, it's not guaranteed to do that. So it may not actually have that effect. So the spending on research and development may actually lead to nothing. And that is a negative of it. And therefore that is why the government provides a 45% tax offset for businesses who conduct it. Subsidies. So the government's more and more moved away from using subsidies in recent years, but subsidies are a payment by businesses 
two businesses by the government to decrease their cost of production and motivate production in specific areas. So things like solar panels, etc., have been the most common ones in recent years. The government's moved away from providing subsidies in recent years. It often leads to businesses relying on these payments and actually reducing productivity. So if you look at the automotive industry, Toyota, um, Ford, Holden, they all moved offshore for a long time. That they were not really competitive with overseas nations because they're high um, minimum wage in Australia. And therefore, the government was giving them subsidies so they could keep producing here to keep jobs in Australia. But what that was doing was meaning that those businesses didn't have to be more efficient because they knew the government would bail them out. When the government stopped bailing them out, they closed down because they couldn't compete. However, job keepers are wage subsidy paid to businesses during the pandemic in 2020. This paid wages for businesses during that time to lower the cost of production for businesses and maintain employment. That's a really, really important bit of language there. It's all about maintaining employment during that time. Um, it's not about increasing employment. A lot of people have been using that in things that I've read. It's not correct because they weren't trying to get more people employed. They're trying to stop people from becoming unemployed. And that is a really, really key thing with that as a subsidy. And our last one, investment in infrastructure. Infrastructure spending aims to improve the quality of a country's capital resources and therefore lead to advances in productivity and increased aggregate supply. Really, really important with infrastructure spending. It's all about the short-term and long-term effects. And the short-term, it can actually lead to um, negative impacts. It can be lead to productive bottlenecks, etc., because we have to like close roads, etc., and make things less efficient. But in the long term, when those roads open up, like the Westgate Tunnel, it's going to lead to more efficiency, lower cost of production for businesses. So products, projects such as the Westgate Tunnel project need to decrease travel times and therefore increase productivity for businesses and output. If they're doing that, that's going to lower their cost of production, increase their productive capacity, increase their production, increase aggregate supply. The government fast-tracked many infrastructure projects in 2020 in an attempt to increase and maintain uh, aggregate supply into the near future. So a lot of um, infrastructure projects for the future have been brought forward to get them happening now to increase employment and also increase our economic growth. Then four. Next up, we've got welfare and tax reform. So welfare and tax reform is great because you've already done a lot of it in budgetary policy, um, but to talk about them both and the changes to them recently. So welfare is designed to benefit the unemployed and disadvantaged. However, it cannot be too generous that people want to remain on it. So the government taking job seeker at first where there weren't jobs available, so they're giving a very generous amount and then slowly decreasing that amount over time. As that amount decreases, people start to see they've got less income overall and it motivates them to join the workforce where they'll earn a higher income. And therefore they will be a more productive member of the workforce because they see that they're earning more money now and they'll want to work. It gives them motivation. Um, whereas for tax reform, decreasing income tax rates motivate people to join the workforce as they'll be earning more than they previously would. So examples of this are like the $1,080 tax offset for lower middle income earners. People know they're going to be earning technically $1,080 more when they do their tax, and therefore they're more motivated to work. They'll work harder, more output per hour worked, more output per unit of input, increasing aggregate supply. Tax reform businesses, on the other hand, like the 30% um, business tax being cut to 25% now, lowers cost of production, it motivates businesses to invest and expand and therefore increases our overall aggregate supply. Then with immigration policy, immigration policy at the moment I feel like will only be asked in a theoretical sense because net migration has been basically zero. We usually use skill migration to alleviate skill shortages but um, and alleviate any productive bottlenecks occurring, but we haven't been doing this at the moment because international borders are closed, people can't come in for these reasons other than we have some special migration for like talent for movies, TV shows, etc. Um, but our three main types of migration are um, special migration, we've got family migration and skilled migration. So they're three important things, but they're not really that relevant at the moment. And finally, our strengths and weaknesses of aggregate supply side policies to achieve our government's domestic macroeconomic goals and how these goals may affect living standards. One really great strength of aggregate supply side policies is they can create non-inflationary growth because it increases our productive capacity and we can produce more without increasing prices, which is excellent. It can also lead to increases in aggregate demand through those flow on effects of creating more, un creating more employment, um, creating more jobs, etc., giving more income to households. Some weaknesses of it is it can cause structural unemployment if aggregate supply leads to cost cutting where businesses lay off workers to replace them with machinery, etc. Um, some policies don't have a guaranteed benefit like research and development. They can also have long implementation impact lag. So things like um, enhancing infrastructure projects, often they won't start for a few years. And then even after that, they won't be finished for many, many years after that. So the implementation impact lags can be very, very long, which prevents them from having a benefit in the short term. So it's not great for short term stabilization. And that is it for all of aggregate supply side policies. So thank you for watching this. We're keeping it under 10 minutes, which is great. If you want anything else, feel free to head to my website, www.therunningeconomy.com. Uh, sign up to the revision lecture, which is in just over 30 days at the moment, which will be three hours of going through everything in economics, potentially longer, answering any questions that people have along the way. On that, I hope you are doing well, and I will see you next time. Goodbye.